Lord. God bless you today. We are so grateful, amen, to be able to hear the great preaching of Pastor Erna as she comes to deliver our Palm Sunday message. So come on, stand to your feet. Let's welcome the spokeswoman for the King of Glory, everybody, Pastor Erna. Thank you. Woo! Thank you, choir. If these weren't my preaching shoes, I would have just... So good, so good, so good. All right, well, it is Palm Sunday, and I want to read to us our scripture that is coming out of Luke 19. And I had a good time thinking about it. I always feel like any passage that's familiar that you hear a lot, and I'm going to preach on it, I want to sit with it until it kind of comes alive for me in a new way. And so I had a good time sitting with this passage, and I want to share some thoughts with you. So in Luke 19, so it says, as he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. And he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. And as he came near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, If you, even you, had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes. Indeed, the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up ramparts around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and they'll crush you to the ground and you and your children within you and they will not leave within you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation from God. And when Jesus entered the temple courts, he began to drive out those who were selling. It is written, he said to them, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. And every day he was teaching at the temple, but the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him, yet they could not find any way to do it because the people hung on his every word. Amen? So let's just talk about this. Um, when, when, I, uh, when I think about scripture, I like to picture it. I like to think of it in images. And so what helped me actually was, um, so let's just set the stage of what's happening in Jerusalem at this time. So Sunday is the beginning. For us, it's the beginning of Holy Week. For the Jewish folks, it was the beginning of a week focused on a remembering when God liberated them from slavery in Egypt. All right, so this is a whole week spent remembering that they were slaves, that they were oppressed, and then God led them out. Now, they're currently under occupation by Rome. So you can imagine that a week of people, and this city's crowded, all the people have packed in, right? Like all the Jewish folks have come out from all over the known world, come in from all over Israel to celebrate this. So it's like being in the city, right, the city that's hosting the Super Bowl, or being in the, right, when something huge is happening, and it's just much fuller than even normal. And everybody is thinking about when they were liberated from slavery. And they're looking around and thinking, what's the next train of thought if you've spent a week thinking about how God got you out of slavery? Do the same thing, God. Get us out from underneath Rome, right? You could see all the activists are going to get together and be like, come on, let's plan us an overthrow, right? All the zealots, all the people who want to like violently overthrow Roman occupation, they're going to be deeply energized at this time. And because of that, Rome isn't dumb. They know that, right? They know that they're occupying uh, Israel, and they know that this is going to be a time particularly where people are going to want to rebel. So how do you think they handle that? They send in a huge military uh, procession. Pilate comes in. Pilate disliked this energy a lot. And so, and, you know, he wasn't like, hey, guys. I get it that it's like a bummer being occupied. No. He goes, before this train of thought can go anywhere, allow me to come in with the most powerful military in the world and make you check that train of thought before it goes anywhere. So you have to think about, this is before television and before movies, before radio, before photography, before uh, people traveled around a lot and saw stuff. So if you're just in your city and all of a sudden, 
there is a parade of the most powerful military force in the known world, it's gonna stand out in a very particular way. What is happening on the same day as this description of what is ha I described about Jesus that I read from Luke 19 is that Pilate has had a triumphal entry into Jerusalem. So let's get a visual on what this would be like. Um, a triumphal entry is all about the glory and the power of Rome. So it would be, there would be images, like the head of the procession would have this gold statue, and then there's all these pendants and these banners, and then there's going to be trumpeters, then there's going to be soldiers on foot. And even though Rome was a long time ago, don't we all know what a Roman soldier looks like? Right? Because that image, that uniform, right, has sunk into our minds. Imagine that marching into your city, row after row. Then there's the cavalry, the soldiers on horses, and then there's the chariots. Right, which is like now for us is just like a good time, but that's incredibly like advanced uh, military tools and weaponry. And sometimes at the end of these parades, they would have prisoners in chains just to show how powerful they were. So I was looking around on the internet in a saved way, and it went silent in there. And I was, um, <laughs> and uh, everyone was like, is she about to confess something? I was like, no, for a clip of a Roman entry. So, um, and there's a clip from the movie Ben-Hur, which is it's a movie that's been remade multiple times. I didn't know a lot about it, but it's basically the story of two brothers who kind of live during the same time as Jesus. And one of them joins the Roman army. And so in the movie is depicted actually this triumphal entry of Pilate. And so we're going to take a look at it, get a little sound and visual. I think that's, to me, that's helpful to see how powerful that would be, the sound, the, some of, you know, uh, the energy. Did you know that the Roman emperor, he was not only considered a ruler, but he was also called a son of God? Did you know that he bore the title of Lord and Savior? Did you know that he was known as one who would bring peace on earth? and that when he died, he would ascend and take his place among the gods. The kingdom of Rome proclaimed Caesar to be the son of the gods and the bringer of peace. But as we can see from this, it was a peace that was made by an army. It was maintained by slaughter of anyone who opposed. Sometimes there would be miles of people on crosses, crucified, showing what would happen to anyone who opposed the peace of Rome. People would walk by for weeks looking at rotting bodies. It was built on the backs of the poor who were stripped of their wealth in order to feed the insatiable greed of growth and empire. Now, on the same day, on the other side of town, there was another parade that Jesus was throwing. And when he was putting it together, he asked his followers to get him a thousand chariots. I'm playing. That's not what he did. He told his followers, get me a donkey. Now, that's a pretty significant contrast to that situation that we just saw there, right? What we need to remember is that this was a choice by Jesus. This wasn't just he was like, oh, no, that's all I could get is this used car with terrible wheels. No, he is making a choice because we have to remember that Jesus is choosing to live within certain limits during his time on earth. But sometimes I think that we think Jesus begins with the moment that he was incarnated. But if we look in Philippians, it said, who being in his very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But we need to imagine, use your imagination for this holy purpose of imagining what was Jesus' life like before he was put into the limits of human skin. When Jesus is wandering around heaven, it's like a thousand angels, right? And I think angels are so interesting. There's like, they're these weird like soldier musicians, apparently. And they're doing their thing. But when Jesus goes by, they're like, oh, you, you are the best. And then like a thousand of them like, agree for all time, you the best, right? And it's just, it flows out of them. It flows out of them because Jesus' greatness is catalyzes such like overwhelming wonder. They're not like, three stars, Google. No. 
like when Jesus is not hiding his glory, it's like overwhelming to every like celestial being in the world. So much so that even creation recognizes him, right? Even when Jesus is cloaked inside this tiny little human suit, when he talks to nature because it's like throwing a storm and that's not what he's here for right then. He's like, shh, I need you to stop. Nature is like, I remember you. You spoke me into existence. I shall indeed stop. <laughs> right? And when demons see, demons are the one. I mean, demons might be possessing everything, but they are on point because they just can't be like, you're the king. We know how much authority you have. And he's like, and they were like, my bad. And they go. <laughs> when he encounters like a thousand demons, yeah. all he has to do is say a sentence. Off, off they go. When he encounters sickness, he doesn't even have to be in its proximity. He just thinks in his mind that those people should be healed, and they're healed. When thousands of people are sitting in front of him and need to be fed, he's like, and done. But it's his glory is hidden. But we have to remember that that is a choice. That when he came, he, you'd think he couldn't have come and just had the most amazing military overthrow of Rome. You think he couldn't have when he wanted to, like, call down all these angel soldiers to be like, it's on. It's time to bring my kingdom. You'd be like, you've been holding us back for millennia, Jesus. We're ready. Right? But he doesn't. So what he does is a choice. Not because he doesn't have any other option. So when he gets on that donkey, it's not like he's sitting in the corner like, I wish I had a chariot, but I got this donkey. He goes, me and who I am and how I'm coming into Jerusalem, I'm doing it on this donkey. And my people, when they celebrate me, they're not doing it with these swords and with these weapons. They're doing it with these palm branches. Choice to bring a totally different, non-violent, non-military oriented, non-imperialistic type of revolution. So he does it differently. He does it differently. He's not going the route of violence, not going the route of military, not going the route of national expansion and empire. He's not going to exploit the poorest of the poor to fund his expansion. He's not going to build peace using violence. And yet, he does make the choice to let them call him Lord and Savior. He does make the choice to let them call him the Son of God. He does use the language of kingdom, which I know in 2019, it has such a colonial and legacy that we don't use it, but it makes sense to me that back in the day when people were under the kingdom of Rome, that he would say, I'm bringing a kingdom of my own, and it would make sense to the people at that time. And he was bringing it in such a different way with such a different set of values. You pray for the persecuted. You love your enemy. The first or last and the last first. Leaders are servants. They don't lord it over people. So on one side of town, you have Pilate and Rome. And on the other side of town, you have Jesus and this donkey. And we need to let that challenge us. We need to let that challenge us. I think about it because I think often when I think about this parade, I just want it to be like this was a moment where like it was all good and everyone understood how awesome Jesus was. But even as it's happening, there's all this conflict, right? Because even as it's happening, you can feel the power, the military power of Rome and be like, how's this tiny little parade going to handle Rome? And even as it's happening, you can feel uh, the Pharisees are like, shh, 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 it's too much. Shh, tell your disciples, shh. Right? And even as it's happening, you know that this crowd that's cheering for him right now is going to be cheering, crucify him just a couple days later. Right. So even as it's happening, we can feel the tension. Jesus, has every time he talks about going to Jerusalem, he talks about it in one way. He says, this is where I'm going to die. And so I have, there's an image that, um, that comes to mind. Actually, when I think about it, I think about it in two ways. One is, uh, uh, many of you know that one of my best friends had cancer, and she passed away from cancer last fall. And in the early summer, we got together to celebrate her 50th birthday. And um, it was like 10 of her closest friends. And it was wonderful, but sad, because we knew it was going to be our last birthday with her. I think as Jesus heads in and people are singing Hosanna to him, that it's wonderful and it's sad. There's an image, there's a painting by Rembrandt that I was going to have us take a look at. And we'll have to drop all the lights so that we can see it. Can we drop the up front? Up. So, um, wait, oh, there we go. Beautiful. So this is a picture of Jesus. 
Just look at it for a moment, and then if you were to use one or two words to describe his expression, tell your neighbor. Like, what's a word or two you would use to describe this expression? So we're going to go, I'm going to cover half his face, all right? So let's go to the next image, and we cover half his face. <laughs> but how does, if you only have this part of his face to go with, how does his expression look? He actually looks pretty happy, right? There's like a little bit of a smile, and his eyes, there's like a little bit of a lift. Now I'm going to cover the other side of his face. And it's, what do you see there? is despair and sadness. What I think is brilliant about this piece of art, and let's go to the one where we have it both together, is that in Jesus' face is both joy and profound grief. And I think this is the face of Jesus on Palm Sunday as he is heading into Jerusalem. And honestly, I'm comforted by this because I think this is true to real life most of the time. I know we're living in 2019 in an Instagram world where everybody only wants to put forward a happy face at all times, but I think the majority of real life is a face that is carrying joy and a face that is carrying suffering at the same time, at the same moment. And so that is the image I think of Jesus as he is coming into Jerusalem, as he is contrasting his parade, his triumphal entry to Pilate's triumphal entry. Do we see the contrast? All right, I'm going to give us a different contrast. Um, about 300 years before the Roman occupation, there was maybe one of the greatest conquerors, military leaders that the known world, uh, that part of the world had ever known. And uh, his name was Alexander the Great. And he went around, conquer, 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 siege, 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 starve him out, win, win, win. All right, this is him. And he, each time he went into a city, though, he would go into their place of worship, and he would actually worship there. Because he had this vision of wanting, like, a united world under his leadership. And so when he came into Jerusalem, and he came to the temple, instead of, like, desecrating it, he actually, like, interacted with the chief priest and went into the temple and gave an offering and worshiped there. And it was really unexpected for this conqueror to do that. But he had this thing where he was trying to build this unity around the whole world. Now let's contrast that to Jesus' choice of what he does when he walks into the temple. Jesus walks into the temple. Does he offer a sacrifice? Does he offer a prayer? Does he sit in total, um, you know, kind of obedient submission? He starts flipping over tables. He gets aggressive and intense and upset and bothered. I mean, I really want you to think about, like, right now, if, like, Pastor Mike just started pushing y'all around and pushing your chairs over and, like, throwing your purses out the window. Like, would you be like, I feel really reflective right now. No. You would feel confused and, like, chaos was happening. What is happening is, in the, like, the way the temple is set up is kind of, like, concentric Circle. So it's like the outside is for Gentiles, and then you go a little further in, it's for Jewish women, and you go a little further in, it's for Jewish men, you go a little further in, it's for the priests, and then the chief priests, and then you go inside. And the further you get to the center, like the closer you get to the presence of God is kind of how it's set up. Well, out here in the court for the Gentiles, they had set up these tables and set up this sort of complex money system. And then this whole thing where they're selling animals that you can use for sacrifice, it's loud, it's chaotic, and it has completely shut down the space that is meant for Gentiles to worship God. It's the place where non-Jews who had converted or people who are living abroad would come and they could worship God here. And when he sees that happening, it bothers him. And he does not, you know, do like a sort of side like, hey guys, let's just take out our journals and think about like, is this what we want to be doing in the court of the Gentiles? For him, it is now a time for disruption. So we have two really interesting choices by Jesus. He contrasts himself to Pilate's triumphal entry by coming in in total humility. He contrasts himself to Alexander's triumphal entry by going into full disruption. 
When you look at all the different people who are watching Jesus, you can see that at every turn, he is both fulfilling expectations and defying expectations, doing what they want and not doing enough of what they want. The, so let's just think, who is watching this? There's the disciples, the crowds, the Pharisees, the Romans, and the people who are collaborating with the Romans. So for example, Let's talk about the zealots. These are the people who want to overturn Rome with like a violent uprising. Is Jesus doing enough to make them happy? No, he's not. He's not political enough. He's not aggressive enough against Roman occupation. What about for the disciples? Is Jesus doing enough or not enough? I think what's interesting about the disciples is they're not as political as they might come off. They sort of become about like team Jesus, like this is our crew, this is our squad, like we want to be winning. So you see this thing as they're cruising around, like some people are casting out demons and they turn to Jesus and they're like, they're not on team Jesus and they're trying to take our casting out demons thing. Don't you think we should call down some fire from heaven and shut that down? Team us, right? And Jesus is like, I'm actually doing something bigger. Let's not be that way. You know, and then they're like walking down their road and they're like, look, when we take over, like who's going to be like your number two and your number, th is it going to be me? It feels like it's going to be me. And he's just like, I'm going to die. So being my number two is probably not what you think it's going to be. <laughs> and you can just see that they don't get it. And they're like, no, but for real, like who will be your number two? So they have this very like my click, my crew, elevate us, elevate us. Is Jesus coming through for them? No, he disappoints their expectations. What about the crowd? Well, you can't make this crowd happy, right? They love him when he feeds them. They love him when he's like casting, you know, casting out demons and like healing them from sickness. But then when he starts giving some challenging teaching and challenging their ethnocentrism, they're like, let's throw him off a cliff. <laughs> you cannot make this crowd happy. And the Romans, we know that in a few days, they will kill him. And they will hang a racial slur over his head. It's not a compliment to murder someone publicly and then say, hey, is this your king? This is your king we murdered here. That's not a compliment. That's not like a theological affirmation, king of the Jews. King of the Jews, this is your king? We killed him. So this is Rome. And this is what we do to your kings. Jesus, he isn't political enough for the zealots. He's too political for the Pharisees. He's too morally rigid for accommodationists like Herod. He's too morally flexible for the scribes. He's too progressive on issues of women and sexuality. He keeps talking to these ladies who sleep around and refuses to throw stones at this woman caught in adultery, but he's just so conservative around certain issues like talking about lust and saying if your hand makes you sin, cut it off. And he puts the responsibility for lust on the looker and not on the wearer of the yoga pants. He's too conservative. Apparently, we'll be starting a small group dedicated to the liberation of yoga pants oppression. <laughs> so much is happening. <laughs> to me, what Palm Sunday is about is about how Jesus will not conform to any one agenda or any one group's expectations. He will not fit neatly into any category, any political party, any particular group's agenda. We cannot think that we under, fully understand his ways. There just aren't our ways. And I think as someone who's been following Jesus for a while, this is a challenging word. Because I want to feel like, Jesus, those Christians over there, they'd be problematic as heck. <laughs> but you and me, right? <laughs> like, right, right. We're going to dismantle white supremacy sometime in my lifetime, right? Right? Are we going to get misogyny and patriarchy out the church in my lifetime, right? Right? I want to feel like he cares about the things I care about and is going to do them in the timeline that I am interested in, in the way that I want him to do it. And I think the thing about it is Jesus is like, yes, I'm doing something revolutionary, but it's also mysterious. It's authoritative, and yet it is completely hidden. It is engaged in this world, and yet it is different than this world. I use some of the language you understand, and then I do stuff that you don't understand. I come into this city on the same day as Pilate, but I don't come in in military style. I go into the temple, and I don't offer a sacrifice, but I overturn these tables and the ways these economic systems have come into your religious worship in weird ways. I stop that. And so to me, I have to be humbled by Palm Sunday 
to say something revolutionary is happening, but if I don't have the humility to pay attention to how and when Jesus is doing it and the way he keeps evolving and changing that in a way that I cannot predict, I will miss it. And I will become just like the Pharisees or the disciples or like Rome or like the crowd. There was a, a pastor friend of mine posted today. She uh, said, um, she goes, uh, don't forget how quickly we can go from Hosanna in the highest to crucify him. Not only when it comes to Jesus, but also to our neighbors and to ourselves. You know, and I think that's what's happening to this congresswoman, right? Ilhan Omar, all this like terrible Islamophobia that's getting thrown at her. A couple months ago, it's like, oh my God, women of color are in Congress. And then four seconds later, it's like, they're probably terrorists. I mean, the crowd, talk about a fickle, fickle crowd. I am challenged by what Jesus is doing. I am challenged not to just feel like I can predict Jesus' moves because I've been in the church for a long time. That seems apparently to be the most dangerous place because it's the disciples who are up close to Jesus who seem to have the hardest time understanding that in the very end, Jerusalem is about going to the cross. That's hard. That's challenging. And then he looks at the city and he weeps. Right? He's not numb, he grieves. And he says, you don't know the ways of peace. And I think we understand that this world does not know the ways of peace. That's not anything surprising to say. In this last week, we saw the white son of a sheriff's deputy arrested, it, arrested for burning black churches. We saw someone arrested for threatening the life of this congresswoman. We see that there is no ways of peace at our borders. All of our trans brothers and sisters getting kicked out of the military after serving the country. We also see that there are not ways of peace in our own house of worship, silencing of victims of abuse. And, you know, I don't know if you guys saw, there was, like, articles going around about this Instagram site. It's called, like, Preachers and Sneakers. You see, it's basically like outing popular pastors for wearing like $2,000 sneakers while preaching. <laughs> now, I'm not going to give a side sermon on my thoughts on that, <laughs> though let's have coffee and chat, because my shoes are also $2,000. I'm just playing. Um, <laughs> But I think the reason there was so much like online glee, you know, and delight is because I think people are really bothered by seeing the marriage of capitalism and Jesus. Like something about it is gross. And people want to see, they want to call that out. And it's, it, people feel disturbed to see it amongst popular up upfront leaders where it feels like people, uh, certain Christian leaders are more shaped by celebrity culture and pop culture, um, and online culture than they are by Jesus. And so I think that's why, you know, a site like that's going to get so much traction in such a short amount of time. Churches get run like businesses, and economic decisions get made. Economic decisions and economics and offering numbers shape what gets preached from the pulpit and what doesn't get preached from the pulpit. Um, I was particularly convicted that we don't know the ways of peace uh, I was, last Sunday, I wasn't here because I went to Portland because I felt uh, God was inviting me to be a part of a particular project. A friend and mentor of mine, a Native American professor of mine, about in 2006, he was in Kentucky, and he had a 50-acre farm, and he and his wife were running this amazing cultural center, an indigenous learning center. It was a place where they really wanted to uh, create a space for Native American people to be able to fully be who they are in their culture and follow Jesus. Because if you have looked at the history of how Christianity and Native folks has been, it's been not only a literal genocide, but particularly a cultural genocide, saying you can't be Native and follow Jesus. And they were creating this beautiful space of peace where that could happen. But not only that, they were doing like job training. They had a sawmill, and it was like how to do um, moldings and frames and stuff. They were coming, creating a community of peace. And just as they were getting ready to expand, uh, a white supremacist paramilitary group set up 50 caliber machine guns on their property line and began to fire bullets at any time of day. This is in 2006. And started a campaign of intimidation that drove them off their land. Which we know that's not the first time 
that that has happened to Native American folks. And because of that, they um, essentially had to sell their property. They had young children. They couldn't have their schools there anymore because it just wasn't safe. So they had to sell their property at way under its value, and they moved to Portland for a season. The reason I was up there is because they're starting a campaign uh, to raise the money to reestablish a space like that again in New Mexico. Um, the farm is called Elahe, and I wanted to get behind it because I think in all this broken world that we're in, people who want to create spaces of peace, that's precious, and I want to be a part of supporting that. And so, and I just see, I feel like after all they've seen, the fact that they're still committed to creating that kind of space of peace, I want to be a part of that. Jesus weeps over the city and says, you don't know the ways of peace. I think that's a haunting, haunting statement. But I think we understand it because of the world we live in now. But I just wanted to end with hope. Because as much as I think Jesus is challenging us that like he, we, can't, he, we can't fit him into our agenda, I think that's exciting because it means we have to keep seeking him for ongoing revelation and relationship. But I want to say that I also see ways that you hear at the way are building peace in ways that are really sacred and precious. I've been in a reflective mood because Palm Sunday last year was my first Sunday here at The Way. I don't know, right? A year, went by fast. And so I want to affirm ways that I see you, um, see uh, that you know the things that make for peace. I know as I've sat down, and this is all just come from different conversations I've had with different ones of you and hearing your stories, some of you coming out of addiction and walking in recovery and making a way of peace in your own life that isn't controlled by the violence of addiction. That's a beautiful thing I see happening in this community. I know some of you who have come out of prison and have come out and built lives of peace where you plugged back into your families and reconnected with your children and your relatives. And that is a way of peace. I think one of the things that has really moved me is listening to many of you talk about your dreams for who you are as a parent. I see so many of you digging deep, deep to do deep work so that you can parent your children in ways that were different than how you were parented. I know a single dad who slept on the sofa for months so that his teenage daughter could have a room of her own. That's beautiful. Parents going to therapy, so that you can manage your anger in ways you never saw your parents manage their anger. That is a way of peace that is happening here. I have seen some of you bring your marriages back from the brink, doing hard, hidden, unglamorous, nobody ever makes a movie about this part of marriage, but this is what it's really about. It's not cute but now I'm still married to this person and I can look at you with love again. <laughs> that is sacred work. <laughs> that is sacred work. And I see you all doing it. I, there's a creating space for dialogue between black folks and Asian folks in your live groups, doing precious little things like not letting your single friends feel alone when they're sick and bringing them soup and medicine. That is a thing of peace as well. Amen. So I want to end by say, saying that I have hope. Because even though I don't fully understand the revolution that Jesus is bringing, and he's not bringing it in the way I would like him to all the time, and he keeps challenging me to change, you change, Jesus. He's like, no, you change. And then I was like, oh. Yeah. I was like, you destroy the white white supremacists, you. And he's like, why don't you try some forgiveness? I was like, why don't you try forgiveness? And he's like, I, I actually have. And, um, and he's like, I modeled it for you and I would love for you to try that out. And I got a journal for a long time. Even though he is not doing the revolution in the way I would like, it is amazing and it is precious. And I see the ways that we are moving towards the things of peace in this congregation and it's glorious and beautiful. And I honor it and I praise God for it. Amen? Amen. Let's stand and let's just sing.